Welcome to USMLEFastTrack.com. This video is going to cover the entire behavioral science chapter starting on page 50 from First Aid for the USMLE Step 1 2013 edition. Behavioral Science, Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Name the different types of clinical studies. The different types of clinical studies includes case control study, cohort study, cross-sectional study, twin concordance study, and adoption study. What subtype of study is case control study? Case control study is observational and retrospective study. What subtype of study is cohort study? Cohort study is observational and prospective or retrospective study. What subtype of study is cross-sectional study? Cross-sectional study is observational study. Describe why case control study is considered observational and retrospective study. Case control study is considered observational and retrospective study because it compares a group of people with disease to a group of people without the disease, and it looks for prior exposure or risk factor. What question does the case control study ask? Case control study asks the question, what happened? What is measured in case control study? In case control study, odds ratio is measured. Give an example of odds ratio. An example of odds ratio would be patients with COPD had higher odds of a history of smoking than those without COPD had. Describe the design of cohort study. Cohort study compares a group of people with a given exposure or a risk factor to a group without such exposure, and it looks to see if the exposure increases the likelihood of the disease. How can cohort study be prospective or retrospective? Cohort study can be prospective if it asks the question, who will develop the disease? Or it can be retrospective if it asks, who developed the disease? Were the patients exposed the ones to develop the disease or the ones that were not exposed that developed the disease? What does cohort study measure? Cohort study measures relative risk. Give an example of relative risk. The example of relative risk would be smokers had a higher risk of developing COPD than non-smokers had. Describe the design of cross-sectional study. In cross-sectional study, it collects data from a group of people to assess the frequency of disease and related risk factors at a particular point in time. What question is asked in cross-sectional study? The question that's asked in cross-sectional study is what is happening? What is measured in cross-sectional study? In cross-sectional study, it measures disease prevalence. What type of data does cross-sectional study show? Cross-sectional study can show risk factor association with disease but does not establish causality. What questions are asked in case control study, cohort study, and cross-sectional study? In case control study, it asks what happened. In cohort study, it asks who will develop disease in prospective situation. And in retrospective, it asks who developed the disease, the people exposed or the non-exposed. And in cross-sectional study, it asks what is happening. Describe the design of twin concordance study. In twin concordance study, it compares the frequency with which both monozygotic twins or both dizygotic twins develop the same disease. What is measured in twin concordance study? Twin concordance study measures heritability. Describe the design of adoption study. The design of adoption study compares siblings raised by biological versus adoptive parents. What is measured in adoption study? Adoption study measures heritability and influence of environmental factors. Clinical trials. What are clinical trials? Clinical trials are experimental study involving humans. What therapeutic benefits are compared in clinical trials? In clinical trials, it compares therapeutic benefits of two or more treatments or of treatment and placebo. What are the best ways to improve quality of clinical trials? The best ways to achieve high quality clinical trial study is when study is randomized, controlled, and double-blinded. What is double-blinded study? Double-blinded study is when neither patient nor doctor knows whether the patient is in the treatment or control group. What is triple-blind study? Triple-blind study is when there is a double-blind situation plus an additional blinding of researchers analyzing the data. So in this, neither patient nor doctor knows whether the patient is in the treatment or in the control group as well as the person analyzing the data is also not aware of who is getting what treatment. Phases of clinical trials. Describe the sample size in phase 1 clinical trial. In phase 1 clinical trial, there is a small number of healthy volunteers. What is the purpose of phase 1 clinical trials of a particular drug? 
In phase one clinical trial, it assesses safety, toxicity, and pharmacokinetics. Describe the sample size in phase two clinical trials of a particular drug. The sample size in phase two clinical trial is a small number of patients with disease of interest. What is the purpose of phase two clinical trials of a particular drug? The purpose of phase two clinical trial is to assess treatment efficacy, optimal dosing, and adverse effects. Describe the sample size in phase three clinical trials. The sample size in phase three clinical trial is a large number of patients randomly assigned either to the treatment under investigation or to the next best available treatment option or a placebo. What is the purpose of phase three clinical trial? The purpose of phase three clinical trial is to compare the new treatment to the current standard of cure. Describe the study sample in phase four clinical trials. In phase four clinical trials, this is the post-marketing surveillance trials of patients after the drug has already been approved. What is the purpose of phase four clinical trials? The purpose of phase four clinical trials is to detect rare or long-term adverse effects. Evaluation of diagnostic tests. Describe the way of evaluating diagnostic tests. The way you evaluate diagnostic tests is to use a two by two table comparing test results with the actual presence of disease. And you look for TP, which is true positive, FP, which is the false positive, TN, which is the true negative, and FN, which is the false negative. So if the test results shows positive and the person actually has the disease, that's true positive. If the test results shows positive, but the person does not have the disease, that's called the false positive. If the test shows negative, but the person has the disease, that's called the false negative. And if the test shows negative and the person does not have the disease, this is the true negative. What are the fixed properties of diagnostic tests? The fixed properties of diagnostic tests are sensitivity and specificity. What are the variable properties of a diagnostic test that vary with prevalence and pretest probability? The positive predictive value and the negative predictive value vary with prevalence and pretest probability. Sensitivity, the true positive rate. What is sensitivity? Sensitivity is the proportion of all people with disease who test positive or the probability that the test detects disease when the disease is present. So if you remember the two by two table that we talked about, it's the TP. Um, so when the test shows positive and the person also has the disease, it's the TP, which is the true positive. What is the equation of sensitivity? The equation of sensitivity is TP over TP plus FN. So that's true positive over true positive plus false negative. And that will give you the equation of sensitivity. Also, the equation of sensitivity is one minus false negative rate. So basically what you're trying to do when you're trying to get sensitivity is how often do you get false results? That you, that's what you're trying to exclude out. What goal are you trying to achieve when using a high sensitivity test? When using high sensitivity test, you're trying to get value approaching 100, which is desirable in ruling out disease and indicates a low false negative rate. And sensitivity tests are used for screening disease with low prevalence. So basically the reason for using high sensitivity tests is to basically get the accurate diagnosis of the disease. So you're trying to look for the actual true positive, actual uh, patients that actually are, uh, have the disease. What is the mnemonic to help you remember sensitivity test? The mnemonic to help you remember sensitivity test is PID, which is positive in disease, and SNOUT, which is sensitivity rules out disease. Describe the scenario if a test had 100% sensitivity. In 100% sensitivity, the false negative would be zero because false negative means that the person actually has the disease, but the test is showing that the person doesn't have disease. So false negative would be zero. That means if they're false negative, that means that are, they are actually true negative. That means they do not have the disease if they're showing negative on a 100% sensitivity test. So again, false negative would be zero. That means all negatives must be true negatives. And in 100% sensitivity, you would have true positive over true positive plus false negative. And since we said false negative is going to be zero in 100% sensitivity test, the equation would equal one. So this would be 100% sensitivity test. And that means that everything it's detecting, it's actually patients that have the disease. Specificity, the true negative rate. What is specificity? Specificity is the proportion of all people without disease who test negative, or the probability that the test indicates a non-disease when the disease is absent. 
So if you remember the two by two table in evaluating diagnostic tests, it would be the true negative portion, which is the TN portion. That means the test shows negative and the person does not have the disease. What are the equations of specificity? The equations of specificity is true negative over true negative plus false positive. And that would be one minus false positive rate. What is the goal when using high specificity tests? The goal in using high specificity rate is to determine the value approaching 100 which is desirable for ruling in disease and indicates a low false positive rate. And high specificity tests are used as a confirmatory test after a positive screening test. What are the mnemonics to help you remember specificity tests? The mnemonics to help you remember specificity tests is NIH which is negative in health and SPIN which is specificity rules in disease. Describe the scenario in 100% specificity test. In 100% specificity test, you would have false positive, which would be zero. So in false positive being zero, all the positive must be true positives. So because if the false positive is zero, then that means all positives must be the true positives. And therefore, the equation for 100% specificity test would be true negative over true negative plus false positive and since we said false positive is zero, the equation comes out to one, and that means this is 100% specificity test. HIV testing. What is the high sensitivity test in HIV testing? The high sensitivity test in HIV is the ELISA test. What is the high specificity test in HIV testing? The high specificity test in HIV testing is the Western blot test. Describe the entire process of HIV testing. In HIV testing, you first of all screen with the ELISA test because it's a high sensitivity test. And in this, there is high false positive rate and low threshold. And then you confirm with the Western blot test because that's a highly specific test. And in this, there is high false negative rate and this has high threshold. So the ones that are high specific, you um, use it to confirm. And to screen, you use the high sensitivity test. Positive predictive value. What is positive predictive value? Positive predictive value is the proportion of positive test results that are true positive. So if the test showed positive and the person actually has the disease, this would be the positive predictive value. So this would also be the probability that the person actually has the disease given a positive test result. What is the equation of positive predictive value? The equation of positive predictive value would be true positive over true positive plus false positive. Describe the factors that influence positive predictive value. Positive predictive value varies directly with prevalence or pretest probability. In a high pretest probability, there would also be high positive predictive value. Negative predictive value, NPV. What is negative predictive value? Negative predictive value is the proportion of negative test results that are true negative. So if the results show negative, the person does not have the disease. So this is the probability that the person actually is disease free given a negative test result. What is the equation of negative predictive value? The equation of negative predictive value is true negative over false negative plus true negative. What are the factors that influence the negative predictive value? Negative predictive value varies inversely with prevalence or pretest probability. High pretest probability will have low negative predictive value. Incidence versus prevalence. What is incidence rate? Incidence rate is the number of new cases in a specified time period over the population at risk during the same time period. What is the mnemonic to help you remember incidence? Just remember an incidence is the new incident that are occurring. What is prevalence? Prevalence is the number of existing cases over the population at risk. What is the mnemonic to help you remember prevalence? In prevalence, just remember that prevalence looks at all current cases. What is an approximation of prevalence? Approximation of prevalence is also incidence rate times average disease duration. And one other thing to note about prevalence that it's greater than incidence for chronic diseases such as diabetes. Quantifying risks. What studies uses the odds ratio? Odds ratio is typically used in case control studies. What is odds ratio? 
odds ratio is when you take two groups of patients, one with the disease, which are the cases, and one without the disease, which are the controls, and you look at risk factors that they're exposed to. So the odds that the group with the disease was exposed to risk factor, which is denoted here by AC, divided by the odds that the group without the disease, which are the controls, was exposed, which is denoted here by BD. So odds ratio would be AC over BD. And that in turn equals AD over BC. And what I mean by AC and BD is you have to look at the 2x2 two two table of risk factors on one end and disease on the other side. Quantifying risk, relative risk. What studies use relative risk? The studies that uses relative risk is the cohort studies. What is relative risk? Relative risk is the risk of developing disease in the exposed group divided by risk in the unexposed group. Give an example of relative risk. An example of relative risk would be if 21% of smokers develop lung cancer and 1% of non-smokers do, then the relative risk is 21 to 1, which equals 21. What is relative risk an approximation of if the prevalence is low? If the prevalence is low, then the relative risk is an approximation of the odds ratio. What is the equation of relative risk? The equation of relative risk is A slash A plus B over C slash C plus D. Quantifying risk, attributable risk. What is attributable risk? Attributable risk is the difference in risk between exposed and unexposed groups, or the proportion of disease occurrence that are attributable to the exposure. Give an example of attributable risk. An example of attributable risk would be if risk of lung cancer in smokers is 21% and risk in non-smoker is 1%, then the difference of these two, which is 20%, so 21% out of the 21% risk of lung cancer in smokers is attributable to smoking. What is the equation of attributable risk? The equation of attributable risk is A over A plus B minus C over C plus D. Quantifying risk, absolute risk reduction, also known as ARR. What is absolute risk reduction? Absolute risk reduction is the absolute reduction in risk associated with a treatment as compared to a control. Give an example of absolute risk reduction. An example of absolute risk reduction would be if 8% of people who receive a placebo vaccine develop flu and 2% of people who receive a flu vaccine, then the absolute risk reduction would be 8% minus 2%, which would be 6%. So in this, 8% of the people that received the placebo vaccine ended up getting the flu, versus 2% of the people that actually received the flu vaccine ended up still getting the flu. That means there is a total absolute risk reduction of 6%. Quantifying risk, number needed to treat and number needed to harm. What is number needed to treat? The number needed to treat is the number of patient who needs to be treated for one patient to benefit. What is the equation of number needed to treat? The equation of number needed to treat is to calculate 1 over absolute risk reduction. What is the number needed to harm? The number needed to harm is the number of patient who needs to be exposed to a risk factor for one patient to be harmed. What is the equation of number needed to harm? The way you calculate number needed to harm is 1 over the attributable risk. Precision versus accuracy. What is precision? The consistency and reproducibility of a test which indicates reliability. And in a precision test, there is absence of random variation in a test. What does random error do to a test? Random error reduces precision in a test. High precision would have a lower standard deviation. What is accuracy of a test? Accuracy of a test is the trueness of test measurements, which indicates validity. And in this, there would be absence of systemic error or bias in a test. What does systemic error do to a test? Systemic error reduces accuracy in a test. Describe the picture of accuracy and precision. In the first picture here, you see a picture of accuracy, which means that it's within the target range. In the second picture, you see precision, where the results are within a localized area. And in this, there is the absence of the random variation. 
In the third picture, you see accuracy and precision. And in this, all the results are in the bullseye area. And in the last picture, this is not accurate nor precise. And the results are all over the place. Bias. What is bias? Bias is something that occurs when there is systemic error or favor in a particular direction. What is selection bias? Selection bias is non-random assignment to participation in a study group. Give examples of selection bias. Example of selection bias is Bergson bias and loss to follow up. What is recall bias? Recall bias is knowledge of presence of disorder which alters the recall by subjects. This is common in retrospective studies. What is sampling bias? Sampling bias is when the subjects are not representative of the general population. Therefore, results are not generalizable. And this is type of a selection bias. What is late look bias? Late look bias is information gathered at an inappropriate time. Give an example of late look bias. An example of late look bias would be using a survey to study a fatal disease. If you're studying a fatal disease, only the people that would be able to answer this would be patients still alive. The people that have already died would not be able to answer the survey. Therefore, this would be a type of late look bias. What is procedure bias? Procedure bias is when subjects in different groups are not treated the same. Give an example of procedure bias. An example of procedure bias would be when more attention is paid to the treatment group. And in this, it would simulate a greater adherence. What is confounding bias? Confounding bias is something that occurs when factor is related to both exposure and outcome, but it's not on the causal pathway. So in confounding bias, the factor distorts or confuses effects of exposure on the outcome. What is lead time bias? Lead time bias is when early detection of disease is confused with increase in survival. And this sort of thing is seen with improved screening because in this, natural history of disease has not changed, but because we're able to detect it early, it makes it seem like the survival has increased. What is observer expectancy effect? Observer expectancy effect occurs when researchers belief in the efficacy of a treatment changes the outcome of that treatment. What is the Hawthorne effect? Hawthorne effect is something that occurs when group being studied changes its behavior owing to the knowledge of being studied. So just because they know that some people are studying them, they change their behavior. Name the five ways of reducing bias. The ways to reduce bias, number one, is to have blind studies to limit influence of participants and researchers on the interpretation of outcomes. Number two is to have placebo control groups. Number three is to have crossover studies in which each subject acts as own control to limit confounding bias. Number four is randomization to limit selection bias and confounding bias. And number five is matching to reduce confounding bias. Statistical distribution. What are the measures of central tendency? The measures of central tendency are mean, median, and mode. What are the measures of dispersion? The measures of dispersion is standard deviation, which is SD, standard error of mean, which is SEM, the z-score, and confidence interval. Normal distribution. What is another name for bell-shaped curve? Another name for bell-shaped curve is the Gaussian curve. What does the bell-shaped curve indicate? The bell-shaped curve indicates mean, median, and mode are all equal. What is the symbol of standard deviation? Sigma is the symbol for standard deviation. What letter depicts sample size? The letter that depicts sample size is the letter N. What is the equation of the standard error of mean, which is SEM? The equation of SEM is standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. What happens to the standard error of the mean SEM as the sample size increases? As the sample size increases, the SEM decreases. Describe the picture on page 54 of the bell-shaped curve. The bell-shaped curve here shows negative 1 sigma, which is the negative 1 standard deviation. So all the things that are in this range is negative, it's negative 1 standard deviation, and also shows negative 2 standard deviation, and negative 3 standard deviation in that range. Also the positive 1 standard deviation, positive 2, and positive 3 standard deviation. All the results that are in the negative 1 and the positive 1 standard deviation consists of 68% of the results. 
all the ones and negative two and positive two standard deviation consists of total of 95% of the total results and everything in the negative three to positive three standard deviation consists of 99.7% of all the results, all the sample size in this range. Positive and negative skew. What does the positive skew indicate? Positive skew curve indicates that mean is greater than the median and median is greater than the mode. Describe the appearance of the positive skew curve. The positive skew curve is asymmetrical with long tail on the right. In the positive skew curve, what is the least affected? In the positive skew curve, the mode is least affected by outliers in the sample. What does negative skew curve indicate? Negative skew curve indicates that mean is less than median and median is less than mode. Describe the appearance of negative skew curve. The appearance of negative skew curve is asymmetrical with long tail on the left. Statistical hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? Null hypothesis, which is indicated by 8-0, this hypothesis is the hypothesis of no difference. In this, there is no association between the disease and the risk factor in the population. What is the alternative hypothesis? The alternative hypothesis, which is indicated by H1, this is hypothesis of some difference. In this, there is some association between the disease and the risk factor in the population. Statistical error types. What is type 1 error or alpha? Type 1 error is stating that there is an effect or difference when none exists. So in this, you are mistakenly accepting the alternative hypothesis and rejecting the null hypothesis. What is alpha indicative of? Alpha is indicative of the probability of making the type 1 error. What is the preset alpha level of significance? The preset alpha level of significance is usually less than 0.05. What is type 1 error also known as? The type 1 error is also known as the false positive error. What is P less than 0.5 indicative of? If P is less than 0.05, there is less than 5% chance that the data will show something that is not really there. What is the mnemonic to help you remember type 1 error? Just remember alpha, which looks like the letter A. So just remember you saw a difference that did not exist. In this, the word saw has the letter A in it. So just remember A, alpha, type 1 error, alpha. What is type 2 error or beta? Type 2 error is stating that there is not an effect or difference when one exists. So what you're basically doing in this is you're failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is in fact false. What is beta indicative of? Beta is indicative of the probability of making the type 2 error. What is type 2 error also known as? The type 2 error is also known as the false negative error. What is the mnemonic to help you remember type 2 error? Just remember type 2 error is the beta and in this, you were blind to the difference that did exist. So just remember setting a guilty man free in this, and the type 1 error was convicting an innocent man. Power 1 minus B. What is power 1 minus B? Power 1 minus B is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is in fact false, or the likelihood of finding a difference if one in fact exists. What increases power 1 minus B? Power 1 minus B increases with increased sample size, with increased expected effect size, and it also increases in increased precision of measurement. What is the mnemonic that helps you remember that power 1 minus B increases with increased sample size? The mnemonic to help you remember this is just remember that increased sample size, you increase power. There is power in number. Meta-analysis. Describe meta-analysis. Meta-analysis pools data and integrates results from several similar studies to reach an overall conclusion. And this large amount of data increases the statistical power. What are factors that influences meta-analysis? The factors that influences meta-analysis is the quality of individual studies or bias in study selection. What is the confidence interval? Confidence interval is the range of values in which a specified probability of the means of repeated sample would be expected to fall. What is the range of confidence interval, CI? CI range from mean minus Z, standard error of mean, to mean plus Z, standard error of mean.
What does 95% confidence interval correspond to? 95% confidence interval corresponds to P equals 0 0.05. What is the Z-score for 95% confidence interval? The Z-score for 95% confidence interval is 1.96. What is the z-score for 99% confidence interval? The z-score for 99% confidence interval is 2.58. A few things to note about confidence interval is that if 95% confidence interval for a mean difference between two variables includes 0, then there is no significant difference and 80 is not rejected. So the null hypothesis is not rejected. If 95% confidence interval for odds ratio or relative risk includes 1, 80 is not rejected. So in this, the null hypothesis is not rejected. If the confidence interval between two groups do not overlap, there is significant difference. And if the confidence interval between two groups overlap, usually there is no significant difference. T-test versus ANOVA versus chi square. What is the T-test? t-test is the test that checks difference between means of two groups. What is the mnemonic to help you remember the t-test? Just remember Mr. T is mean. What is ANOVA? ANOVA is the test that checks difference between the means of three or more groups. What is the mnemonic to help you remember ANOVA? A mnemonic to help you remember ANOVA is just remember ANOVA equals analysis of variance of three or more groups. What is chi square? Chi-square is a test that checks difference between two or more percentages or proportions of categorical outcomes, and it does not use the mean values. So Chi-square compares percentages or proportions. Pearson's correlation coefficient, denoted by the letter R. What is Pearson's correlation coefficient always between? Pearson's correlation coefficient is always between negative 1 and positive 1. What is the benefit of having Pearson's correlation coefficient closer to 1? The closer the absolute value of Pearson's correlation coefficient is to 1, the stronger the linear correlation between the two variables. What is the coefficient of determination? The coefficient of determination is the R2, the value that is usually reported. Disease prevention. What is the primary disease prevention? The primary disease prevention is to prevent disease occurrence. Give an example of disease prevention. An example of disease prevention would be HPV vaccination. What is secondary disease prevention? The secondary disease prevention would be early detection of disease. Give an example of early detection of disease. An example of this would be to get a pap smear. What is tertiary disease prevention? Tertiary disease prevention would be to reduce disability from disease. Give an example in ways to reduce disability from disease. An example of this would be chemotherapy. What is the mnemonic to help you remember disease prevention? The mnemonic to remember this is just remember PDR. P is to prevent, D is to detect, and R is to reduce disability. Medicare and Medicaid. What is Medicare and Medicaid? Medicare and Medicaid are federal programs that originated from amendments to the Social Security Act. Who is Medicare available for? Medicare is available to patients 65 years of age or older. It can also be available to patients under the age of 65 with certain disabilities and those with end-stage renal disease. What is Medicaid? Medicaid is a joint federal and state health assistance for people with very low income. What is the mnemonic to help you remember Medicare and Medicaid? The mnemonic to help you remember Medicare and Medicaid is just remember Medicare has the E at the end, and that's for elderly, and Medicaid has the D at the end, which is for destitute. Core ethical principles. What is patient autonomy? Patient autonomy is the obligation to respect patients as individuals and to honor their preference in medical care. What is beneficence? Beneficence is when physicians have a special ethical duty to act in patients' best interest. It may conflict with autonomy, but if the patient is able to make informed decision, ultimately the patient has the right to decide. What is non-maleficence? Non-maleficence is do no harm. However, if the benefit of an intervention outweighs the risk, a patient may make an informed decision to proceed. Most surgeries and medication falls into this category. What is justice? 
Justice is to treat persons fairly. Informed consent. What is legally required to get informed consent? Legally requires discussion of pertinent information, patient's voluntary agreement to the plan of care, and freedom from coercion. What are the exceptions to informed consent? The exceptions to informed consent includes patients lacks decision-making capacity or is legally incompetent. There is implied consent in an emergency. Also, the physician may have therapeutic privilege in which withholding information when disclosure would severely harm the patient or undermine informed decision-making capacity. And there is also exceptions to informed consent if the patient waives the right to informed consent. A few very important notes about informed consent is the patient must have an intelligent understanding of the risk, benefit, and alternatives, which may also include non-intervention. And also, written consent may be revoked by patient at any time, even if they say it orally. Consent for minors. Who is a minor? A minor is generally any person under the age of 18. Describe when it's necessary to get parental consent when treating a minor. When treating a minor, you always have to get parental consent unless the minor is emancipated. And emancipated just means if the person is married, is self-supporting, they have children, or is in the military. What are the situations when treating a minor, parental consent is not required? Parental consent is not required in emergency situation, prescribing contraceptives, treating STDs, medical care of pregnancy, and treatment of drug addiction. Decision-making capacity. In decision-making capacity, physician must determine whether the patient is psychologically and legally capable of making particular health care decision. What are the components to evaluate decision-making capacity? The components to evaluate decision-making capacity is if the patient makes and communicates a choice. Patient is informed, knows and understands what the procedure and the treatment is going to be. Decision remains stable over time. Their decision is consistent with patient's values and goals, not clouded by mood disorder. And the physician has to be sure that the patient's decision is not a result of delusion or hallucinations. Can the patient's family require the doctor to withhold information from the patient if the patient demonstrates decision-making capacity? The answer to that is no. The patient's family cannot require the doctor to withhold any information from the patient as long as the patient still demonstrates decision-making capacity. Advanced Directives What is Advanced Directives? Advanced Directives are instructions given by patient in anticipation of the need for a medical decision, and these are state-specific. What is Oral Advanced Directive? Oral Advanced Directive is when incapacitated patients prior oral statement commonly used as a guide. In this, a patient is informed of the possible outcome, directive from the patient was specific, patient made a choice, and decision was repeated over time to multiple people, the oral directive is more valid. What is another name for living will? Another name for living will is written advance directive. What is stated in a written advance directive? In a written advanced directive, it states the treatment that the patient wishes to receive or not receive if he or she loses decision-making capacity. Usually, in written advanced directive, a patient directs physicians to withhold or withdraw life-sustaining treatment if he or she develops a terminal disease or enters a persistent vegetative state. What is the purpose of medical power of attorney? The purpose of medical power of attorney is if a patient wants to designate an agent to make medical decisions in the event he or she loses decision-making capacity. In this, a patient may also specify a decision in clinical situations, and the patient also has the right to revoke this at any time patient wishes, regardless of competence. The medical power of attorney is more flexible than a living will. Surrogate Decision Maker when can a surrogate decision maker be used in clinical situations? In clinical situation, if an incompetent patient has not prepared an advanced directive, individuals who knows that patient must determine what the patient would have done if he or she was competent. Name the priority of surrogates from high priority to low priority. From high priority to low, it goes spouse, then adult children, followed by parents, then adult siblings, and then other relatives.
Confidentiality. What is the purpose of confidentiality? Confidentiality respects the patient's privacy and autonomy. If a patient is not present or is incapacitated, disclosing information to family and friends should be guided by professional judgment of patient's best interest. The patient may also waive the right to confidentiality like with the insurance companies. Name the four general principles for exception to confidentiality. The general principle for exception to confidentiality includes potential harm to others is serious, if there is a likelihood of harm to self is great, if there is no other alternative means exist to warn or to protect those at risk, and if physician can take steps to prevent harm. So basically, if they are a potential harm to themselves or to others, this is a reason for exception to confidentiality. Give some examples of exception to confidentiality. Some exceptions include reportable diseases such as STD, TB, hepatitis, and food poisoning. In these cases, physicians may have a duty to warn public officials who will then notify people at risk. The second example of exception would be the Tarasov decision. The Tarasov decision was something that happened in California by the Supreme Court. And in this decision, it requires physician to directly inform or protect potential victims from harm may involve breach of confidentiality. So basically, if the person is going out and about to kill somebody, you could inform that person so they could protect themselves. Another example of exception would be if a child or an elderly are being abused. Also, impaired automobile drivers can also be reported and suicidal or homicidal patients can also be reported. So all these that we talked about are all examples of exceptions in confidentiality. Ethical situations. What is an appropriate response if a patient is not adherent, which means they're not listening or they don't want to understand you? The appropriate response would be to attempt to identify the patient's reason for non-adherence and to determine his or her willingness to change. What should you not do in a situation when patient is not adherent? What you should not do is attempt to coerce the patient into adhering or refer the patient to another physician. What is an appropriate response if a patient desires an unnecessary procedure? The appropriate response if a patient desires an unnecessary procedure would be to attempt to understand why the patient wants the procedure and address the underlying concern. What should you not do if a patient desires an unnecessary procedure? What you should not do is refuse to see the patient or refer him or her to another physician and also avoid performing unnecessary procedures. What is an appropriate response or action if a patient has difficulty taking medication? An appropriate response or action if a patient has difficulty taking medication would be to provide written instructions, also attempt to simplify treatment regimen, and use the teach-back method. In this, you ask the patient to repeat medication regimen back to the physician to ensure patient's comprehension. Ethical Situations What is the appropriate response or action if the family member asks for information about patient's prognosis? The appropriate response or action would be to avoid discussing issues with relatives without the permission of the patient. What would be an appropriate response or action if a child wishes to know more about his or her illness? An appropriate response would be to ask the child what the parents have told the child about his or her illness. Because the parents of the child decide what information can be relayed about the illness. What would be an appropriate response or action if a 17-year-old girl is pregnant and requests an abortion? In this situation, many states require parental notification or consent for minors for an abortion. Unless the patient is at medical risk, do not advise a patient to have an abortion regardless of her age or the condition of the fetus. Ethical Situations what would be an appropriate response or an action if a 15-year-old girl is pregnant and wants to keep the child, but her parents want you to tell her to give up the child for adoption? In this situation, the patient retains the right to make decision regarding her child, even if the parents disagree. You should then also provide information to the teenager about the practical issues of caring for a baby, discuss the options if requested, and also encourage discussion between the teenager and her parents to reach the best decision.
What is an appropriate response or an action if a terminally ill patient requests physician's assistance in ending own life? For this situation, in the overwhelming majority of the state, refuse involvement in any form of physician-assisted suicide. Physicians may, however, prescribe medically appropriate analgesic that coincidentally shortens the patient's life. What is an appropriate response or an action if the patient is suicidal? An appropriate response or an action would be to assess the seriousness of the threat. If it's serious, suggest the patient remain in the hospital voluntarily. Patient can also be hospitalized involuntarily if he or she refuses. Ethical Situations What is an appropriate response or an action if a patient states that he or she finds you attractive? In this situation, ask direct, close-ended questions and use a chaperone if necessary. Romantic relationship with patient is never an appropriate thing. Never say there can be no relationship while you're a patient because that implies that the relationship may be possible if the individual is no longer a patient. What is an appropriate response or an action if a woman who has had a mastectomy says she feels ugly when she undresses? An appropriate response or action would be to find out why the patient feels this way, but do not offer falsely reassuring statements, for example, like, you still look good. What is an appropriate response or an action if a patient is angry about the amount of time he or she spends in the waiting room? An appropriate response or an action would be to acknowledge the patient's anger, but do not take the patient's anger personally. Then go ahead and apologize for any inconvenience and stay away from efforts to explain the delay. Ethical Situations What is an appropriate response or an action if a patient is upset with the way he or she was treated by another doctor? In this situation, suggest that the patient speak directly to the physician regarding the patient's concern. If the problem is with a member of the office staff, tell the patient you will speak to that individual personally. What is an appropriate response or an action if a drug company offers a referral fee for every patient a physician enrolls in a study? In this situation, an eligible patient who may benefit from the study may be enrolled, but it's never acceptable for a physician to receive compensation from a drug company. If the patient is enrolled in a study, they must be told about the existence of a referral fee. What is an appropriate response or an action if a physician orders an invasive test for the wrong patient? In this situation, no matter how serious or trivial a medical error, a physician is ethically obligated to inform the patient about the mistake that has been made. What is an appropriate response or an action if a patient requires a treatment not covered by his or her insurance? In this situation, you are never to limit or deny care because of the expense in time or money. You are always to discuss all treatment options with the patient, even if some of them are not covered by the insurance companies. APGAR score. What is the use of APGAR score? APGAR score is for the assessment of newborn's vital signs following labor via a 10-point scale evaluated at 1 minute and 5 minutes. What does APGAR stand for? APGAR stands for A is for appearance, P is for pulse, G is for grimace, a is for activity and R is respiration. Grimace is when they just make a face if they're in pain or if they're in disgust of some sort. What is considered a good APGAR score? A good APGAR score is anything that's 7 or above. What should you do to a newborn with an APGAR score between 4 and 6? An APGAR score between 4 and 6, you need to assist and stimulate them. What needs to be done to a newborn if the APGAR score is below 4? If an APGAR score is below 4, you need to resuscitate them. If the newborn has an APGAR score that's under 4 at the 5 minute mark, what would be the consequence of this? If the APGAR score is less than 4 at the 5 minute mark, there is an increased risk the child will develop long term neurological damage. Low birth weight. When can a newborn be set to have low birth weight? If a newborn has birth weight that's less than 2500 grams, the newborn has low birth weight. What can be the cause of low birth weight? Low birth weight can be caused by prematurity or intrauterine growth retardation. What are some conditions associated with low birth weight? Low birth weight is associated with increased risk of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome, and increased overall mortality. What are some other problems that can arise with low birth weight? 
Low birth weight can lead to impaired thermal regulation and immune function, hypoglycemia, polycythemia, and impaired neurocognitive and emotional development. What are some complications that can arise in newborns with low birth weight? Complications that can arise include infections, respiratory distress syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, intraventricular hemorrhage, and persistent fetal circulation. Early developmental milestones. What are some of the motor milestones seen in an infant from birth to three months of age? The motor milestones include rooting reflex, holds the head up, and the moral reflex disappears. What are social milestones seen in an infant from birth to three months of age? Social milestones include social smile. What is verbal and cognitive milestones seen in an infant from birth to three months of age? Verbal and cognitive milestones seen in an infant from birth to three months of age includes orients and response to voice. What are motor milestones seen in an infant from seven months to nine months of age? Motor milestones from seven to nine months of age include sits alone, crawls, and gains the ability to transfer toys from hand to hand. What are social milestones seen in an infant from seven to nine months of age? In an infant seven to nine months of age, the social milestone would be stranger anxiety. What are verbal and cognitive milestones seen in an infant from seven to nine months of age? In an infant seven to nine months of age, the verbal and cognitive milestone would be they would respond to name and simple instructions. They would also use gestures and plays peekaboo. What are the motor milestones seen in an infant from 12 to 15 months of age? In an infant 12 to 15 months of age, the motor milestone includes they would start walking and the Babinski sign disappears. What is a social milestone seen in an infant from 12 to 15 months of age? Social milestone in an infant 12 to 15 months of age would be separation anxiety. What is verbal and cognitive milestone seen in an infant from 12 to 15 months of age? In an infant 12 to 15 months of age, they would start saying few words. Early developmental milestones, toddlers. What are motor milestones seen in a toddler from 12 to 24 months of age? In a toddler that's 12 to 24 months of age, the motor milestone would include they would have the ability to climb stairs and they would also be able to stack blocks of three blocks at age one and six blocks at age two. What is the calculation that will help you remember how many blocks a toddler is able to stack? The calculation, just remember age times three, that will give you the number of blocks that a toddler is able to stack. And so if the age is two times three, which would be six blocks at the age of two. What social milestone would be achieved by a toddler from 12 to 24 months of age? Social milestone that would be achieved by a toddler 12 to 24 months of age would be rapprochement in which the toddler moves away from the mother but always knows to return back to the mother. What verbal and cognitive milestone would a toddler 12 to 24 months of age would achieve? Toddler of this age would be able to say 200 words and two word phrases at the age of two. What motor milestone would a toddler 24 to 36 months of age achieve? A motor milestone that a 24 to 36 month old toddler would achieve would be to feed themselves with a fork and spoon and they would also have the ability to kick a ball. What social milestone would a 24 to 36 month old toddler be able to achieve? A 24 to 36 month old toddler would be able to have core gender identity and can parallel play and parallel play just means when uh, two children are playing adjacent to one another they're playing and sharing so that's the parallel play what verbal and cognitive milestone would be achieved by a toddler 24 to 36 months of age in a toddler 24 to 36 months of age they would be toilet trained what is the mnemonic to help you remember that a toddler is toilet trained at the age of three just remember that they pee at age three Early developmental milestones in the preschool age, which is age 3 and 4. What motor milestone does a child achieve at the age of 3? A motor milestone that a child is able to achieve at the age of 3 is they are now able to ride tricycles and they are also able to copy lines or circle drawings. What is a mnemonic that helps you remember that a child is able to ride tricycles at the age of 3? The mnemonic to help you remember this is remember that a child rides 3 cycle at the age 3. What social milestone is achieved by a child three years of age? A child that's three years of age, they're able to comfortably spend part of the day away from mother. 
What verbal and cognitive milestone is achieved by a child three years of age? Verbal and cognitive milestone that's achieved by a child three years of age is they are now able to say 900 words and can also say complete sentence. What motor milestone is achieved by a child four years of age? A motor milestone that's achieved by a child four years of age is they are now able to use buttons and zippers. They can also groom themselves and also brushes the teeth. They hops on one foot and makes simple drawings like stick figures. What social milestone is achieved by a child that's four years of age? A social milestone that is achieved by a child four years of age is that they are now able to have cooperative play and have imaginary friends. What verbal and cognitive milestone is achieved by a child four years of age? At this age, a child can tell detailed stories and use prepositions. Changes in the elderly. What are the sexual changes that elderly men face? The sexual changes elderly men face include slow erection and ejaculation and longer refractory period. What are the sexual changes that elderly women face? Elderly women have vaginal shortening thinning and dryness. What happens to the sleep pattern in elderly? The sleep pattern of elderly has decreased REM and slow wave sleep. They also have increased latency and awakenings. Do the suicide rate in the elderly increase or decrease? The suicide rate increases in elderly. Men 65 to 74 years of age have the highest suicide rate in the United States. Name all the other changes seen in elderly. Other changes include decrease in vision, decreased hearing, decreased immune response, and decreased bladder control. There is also decreased renal, pulmonary, and GI function, along with decreased muscle mass and increase in fat. What are some of the things that do not decrease in elderly? Sexual interest and intelligence do not decrease in elderly. Grief. What is grief? Grief is normal bereavement characterized by shock, denial, guilt, and somatic symptoms. How long can grief last? Grief can last up to one year. What are some unusual experiences that a person may have during grief? During grief, a person may experience illusions. Describe situations when grief can become pathologic. Grief can become pathologic when it's excessive intense grief or the grief has prolonged lasting more than two to six months or grief that is delayed, inhibited, or denied. During the time of grief, a person may experience depressive symptoms, delusions, and hallucinations. Behavioral Science Physiology Sexual Dysfunction Name all the different types of sexual dysfunction. All the different types of sexual dysfunction include sexual desire disorder, in which a person has hypoactive sexual desire or sexual aversion. So in this, a person is trying to either avoid or does not like sexual activities. The second is sexual arousal disorder, such as erectile dysfunction. The third is orgasmic disorder, such as anorgasmia or premature ejaculation. And lastly, it's the sexual pain disorder, such as dyspareunia or vaginismus. Define dyspareunia. Dyspareunia is a painful sexual intercourse due to medical or psychological causes. And this is a condition that happens almost exclusively to women. What is vaginismus? Vaginismus is a painful spasmodic contraction of the vagina in response to physical contact or pressure. Name the group of drugs that can cause sexual dysfunction. The group of drugs that can cause sexual dysfunction includes antihypertensives, neuroleptics, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and ethanol. What are some diseases that can cause sexual dysfunction? Sexual dysfunction can happen in diseases such as depression and diabetes. What is a psychological cause of sexual dysfunction? A psychological cause of sexual dysfunction is performance anxiety. Body Mass Index or BMI What is Body Mass Index? Body Mass Index or BMI is a measure of weight adjusted for height. What is the equation of BMI? The equation of BMI is weight in kilos over height in meters squared. What BMI is underweight defined as? Underweight is defined as BMI under 18.5. What BMI is normal weight defined as? Normal weight is defined as BMI that's 18.5 to 24.9. What BMI is overweight defined as? Overweight is defined as BMI that's between 25 to 29.9. What BMI is obesity defined as? Obesity is defined as BMI that's greater than 30. What BMI is severe obesity defined as? Severe obesity is defined as BMI that's greater than 35. 
What BMI is morbid obesity defined as? Morbid obesity is defined as BMI that's greater than 40. What BMI is super obesity defined as? Super obesity is defined as BMI that's greater than 45. Sleep stages. Name the sleep stage and the percent of total sleep time in young adults. First is awake with eyes open, then it's awake with eyes closed, then it's stage N1 which is 5% of total sleep time in young adults, then it's stage N2 which is 45% of sleep time in young adults, and then stage N3 which is 25% of total sleep time in young adults, and then it's the REM sleep which also is 25% of total sleep time in young adults. Describe the stage awake when the eyes are open. In awake, when the eyes are open, you are alert and there is active mental concentration. What electroencephalography waveform is observed when you are in the awake stage and the eyes are open? In the awake stage, when the eyes are open, you observe the beta waveform and this has the highest frequency and the lowest amplitude. What EEG waveform is observed in awake stage but the eyes are closed? The EEG waveform, when the eyes are closed but you're still awake, you observe the alpha waveform. Describe the N1 stage of sleep. The N1 stage of sleep is the light sleep. What EEG waveform is seen in stage N1? The EEG waveform that is seen in stage N1 is theta. Describe stage N2 of sleep. The stage N2 of sleep is the deeper sleep and this is where bruxism happens and bruxism is grinding of your teeth. What EEG waveform is seen in stage N2 of sleep? In stage N2 of sleep, you see sleep spindles and K-complexes. Describe stage N3 of sleep. The stage N3 is the deepest sleep. This is the non-REM sleep, also known as the slow wave sleep. And this is when sleepwalking happens, night terror happens, and bedwetting happens. What EEG waveform is seen in stage N3 of sleep? The EEG waveform observed in stage N3 of sleep is the delta. This has the lowest frequency and the highest amplitude. So this is the opposite of the beta waveform. Describe what happens during REM sleep. REM sleep is when dreaming happens, loss of motor tone happens, and this is possibly said to have memory processing functions. You can also get an erection during REM sleep, and there is increased brain oxygen use. What EEG waveform is seen in REM sleep? EEG waveform seen in REM sleep is the beta. What is the mnemonic to help you remember all the EEG waveforms? The mnemonic is that at night, bats drink blood. The B stands for beta, which happens in awake when your eyes are open. A is for alpha, which happens in awake with eyes closed. T is for theta, which happens in stage N1. S is for sleep spindles and K-complexes, which occurs in stage N2. D is for delta, which happens in stage N3. And B for blood is in REM sleep for beta. Sleep stages physiology. What is responsible for initiating sleep? The serotonin predominance on the RAF nucleus is the key to initiating sleep. What is the drug of choice in preventing bedwetting? The drug of choice in preventing bedwetting is oral desmopressin acetate, also known as DDAVP. And the reason this drug is helpful is because it mimics the action of vasopressin, which is also known as ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Why is oral desmopressin acetate preferred over imipramine? The reason oral desmopressin acetate is preferred over imipramine is because imipramine has adverse effects. What are some drugs that can reduce REM and delta sleep? Drugs that can reduce REM and delta sleep includes alcohol, benzodiazepines, and barbiturates. What group of drugs are used in the treatment of night terrors and sleepwalking? The drugs that are used in the treatment of night terrors and sleepwalking are benzodiazepines. REM sleep. How often does REM sleep occur? REM sleep occurs every 90 minutes. And the duration of REM sleep increases throughout the night. What is the principal neurotransmitter in REM sleep? The principal neurotransmitter in REM sleep is acetylcholine. What neurotransmitter can reduce REM sleep? Norepinephrine can reduce REM sleep. What are all the findings observed in REM sleep? All the findings of REM sleep includes increased and variable pulse and blood pressure. Also, you have extraocular movement during REM sleep due to activity of PPRF, which is the paramedian pontine reticular formation, 
also known as the conjugate gaze center. And also you have penile or clitoral tumescence, and tumescence just means that it's excited or erected. What is the mnemonic to help you remember some of the findings of REM sleep? The mnemonic to help you remember this is just remember REM sleep is like sex. In sex, you also have increased pulse, just like in REM sleep, you also have increased pulse. There is penile and clitoral tumescence, so that means penis or the clitoris is excited, and there's decrease in frequency with age. So all these things happen in sex as well as in REM sleep. What are some of the terms given to REM sleep? Because REM sleep has the same EEG pattern as wakefulness. Because REM sleep has the same EEG pattern as wakefulness, it has been termed paradoxical sleep or desynchronized sleep. Sleep patterns of a depressed patient. What are all the sleep pattern changes in a depressed patient? In a depressed patient, there would be decreased slow wave sleep, so that is stage N3. There would also be decreased REM latency, and REM latency just means that after a person falls asleep, the time it takes for the person's first onset of REM sleep. In a depressed patient, there would also be increase in REM duration early in the sleep cycle. Normally, for a normal person, the REM sleep duration increases as the cycle goes on, but in a depressed patient, the REM sleep duration increases early in the, REM, in the sleep cycle. A depressed patient also has repeated nighttime awakenings and early morning awakening, which is an important screening question. Narcolepsy. What is narcolepsy? Narcolepsy is a disordered regulation of sleep-wake cycles. What is the primary characteristic of narcolepsy? The primary characteristic of narcolepsy is excessive daytime sleepiness. What type of hallucinations can narcolepsy patients have? Narcolepsy patients can have hypnagogic hallucinations, which is hallucinations just before sleep, or hypnopompic hallucinations, which is hallucinations just before awakening. What sleep cycle does a patient with narcolepsy go directly into when they fall asleep? A patient with narcolepsy, right when they fall asleep, they go into REM sleep. What other condition is sometimes associated with narcolepsy? Another condition associated with narcolepsy is cataplexy. What is cataplexy? Cataplexy is loss of muscle tone following a strong emotional stimulus. Is genetics a strong component in narcolepsy? Yes, genetics is a strong component in narcolepsy. What drugs are used in the treatment of narcolepsy? The drugs used in the treatment of narcolepsy includes daytime stimulants such as amphetamines and modafinil because in the daytime you want to keep them up because they're going to be sleepy during the day and that is one of the characteristic of narcolepsy that during the daytime they have excessive sleepness so you want to keep them up during the day by giving them amphetamines or modafinil and at nighttime you want to give them sodium oxabate also known as GHB. Circadian rhythm. What drives the circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm is driven by suprachiasmatic nucleus, also known as SCN, of the hypothalamus. What is the responsibility of the circadian rhythm? Circadian rhythm controls ACTH, which is the adrenocorticotropic hormone, prolactin, melatonin, and nocturnal norepinephrine release. Describe how from suprachiasmatic nucleus, melatonin is eventually released. The suprachiasmatic nucleus controls the release of norepinephrine that will have an effect on the pineal gland and that will release melatonin. What regulates the suprachiasmatic nucleus? The suprachiasmatic nucleus is regulated by environment such as the light. Sleep terror disorder. What is sleep terror disorder? Sleep terror disorder is when a patient has periods of terror with screaming in the middle of the night. In which stage of the sleep cycle does sleep terror occur? Sleep terror occurs during slow wave sleep, which is stage N3. Who most commonly suffers from sleep terror disorder? Sleep terror disorder commonly happens in children. What is the difference between sleep terrors and nightmares? The difference between sleep terrors and nightmares is that sleep terror occurs during non-REM sleep, so there is no memory of arousal as opposed to nightmares that occur during REM sleep, and there is memory of scary dream. So when sleep terrors happen, the person does not remember this because it's happening during non-sleep time, and nightmares is something that people can remember, and the reason for that is because it's occurring during REM sleep. What are the causes of sleep terror disorder? The cause of sleep terror disorder is unknown, but triggers may include emotional stress during the previous day. There can also be fever that can lead to sleep terror disorder or the lack of sleep.
Does sleep terror disorder require treatment? No, sleep terror disorder does not require any treatment and is usually self-limited. That is the end of the behavioral science chapter.